a little cold and snowy Thursday, so that was a little surprising for a lot of us. But uh, let's a uh, couple announcements today. But first, we'll kick it off with the public health day with Dr. Chan. Great. Good afternoon. Good to be back with all of you um, this week. Uh, just a few brief updates uh, for today. We are um, reporting 515 um, new people diagnosed with COVID-19 in the state today. Um, it's important to note that over 100 of these cases are actually associated with the uh, um, outbreak in the federal prison um, up in Berlin, New Hampshire, um, which is uh, causing the numbers to be higher um, on today's um, report. Uh, but in the last week, we have been averaging um, around 350 new infections per day, which is a decrease uh, from where we were um, even a couple of weeks ago. Um, currently, there are 3,233 people with active infection, uh, and our test positivity rate, that's the percentage of all tests that are positive for COVID-19, uh, is down to 4.5%, which is also a, a decline um, from where we were uh, even a, a week or two ago. Um, in terms of hospitalizations, 112 people uh, statewide currently are hospitalized with COVID-19. Uh, and then, unfortunately, one new person uh, to announce that has uh, been confirmed to have died uh, from COVID-19, bringing the total number of uh, deaths during this pandemic from COVID-19 to 1,274. Um, so as seen in the daily incidence numbers, the test positivity numbers, uh, and even the hospitalization numbers, uh, the last week or so, the COVID-19 numbers are starting to come back down. Um, this uh, we, is a trend we hope will continue, uh, but to, just to stress that the, the levels of community spread continue to be high. Um, and so getting the COVID-19 vaccine is one of the most important things people can do right now uh, to protect themselves, to protect their families, to protect their communities. We continue to also stress the importance that people uh, continue to wear face masks when out in public locations, especially if they're um, in indoor places where they may come into close contact with other people. Uh, we continue to stress the importance of social distancing uh, and avoiding large gr uh, crowds and gatherings um, in order to bring the numbers down further. Uh, there is data that shows that vaccination combined with these community mitigation measures will help us control the pandemic more effectively, uh, bring the numbers down more quickly, and help us get back to normal um, at a more rapid pace. And with that, I will hand things over to Dr. Daly. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll provide a vaccine update. To date in New Hampshire, we have administered 984,000 doses of vaccine. This includes 637,000 people that have received their first dose. This is 47% of the total New Hampshire population. And of those, 387,000 people are fully vaccinated, which is 28% of the population. We continue to receive around 50,000 first doses of vaccine each week between the doses that are allocated to us at the state as well as our pharmacy partners. And at this point, over half the people in New Hampshire who are age eligible have already made that choice to get vaccinated. This is a great start and we'd love to see more people make this choice. We still have thousands of open appointments available across our state at over 200 different locations where you can get vaccinated. This weekend, we do have a super site event at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway. It's on Saturday, April 24th. Originally, we had planned to have this event be on Saturday and Sunday, and it's to provide second dose doses to people who were vaccinated at the end of March at a super site that provided Pfizer vaccine. Um, all of the Sunday appointments for this weekend super site at the Speedway have been moved to Saturday, so we're only operating the super site for one day this weekend. And again, it's only for individuals that receive their first vaccine dose at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway at the end of March. Uh, since we've opened more vaccination sites and have made many more appointments available over the last month, many people had actually gone into Vinny and moved up that vaccination appointment. And so that meant that we have less people to vaccinate as part of the super site. And so we're able to do everyone um, in one day instead of two days. So just letting sharing that information with you about why we have moved to a single day of operation at that super site. We have let everyone who the schedule change affects know by either email or text. 
it went out pro to those individuals who had Sunday appointments and moved them to a Saturday appointment. If for some reason your Saturday appointment time doesn't work for you, you can go into Vinny and change that yourself, or if you have any issues at all, you can certainly call us at 211 to reschedule. So just want to reiterate that no appointments have been canceled. Everyone who wants to get vaccinated this weekend at the super site who was vaccinated at the prior Pfizer super site will still have an appointment and can, can get vaccinated. And with that, I think I will turn it over to Commissioner Chivinette. Good afternoon, just a brief update on institutional outbreaks. We are closing one institutional outbreak today. The Rockingham County House of Corrections is closed for, as for their outbreak has closed. We have no new outbreaks to announce. That leaves our current total of institutional outbreaks at two, the Coas County Nursing Home and the Federal Prison in Berlin. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, as I mentioned, we have a, a few short announcements today. Um, some good news stuff. You know, as we fully, as we work to fully reopen our state over the next few weeks, um, we obviously continue to urge folks and create that opportunity for people to get back into the workforce um, at a three percent unemployment rate, as was reported recently. Uh, New Hampshire continues to have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. Uh, it's good news. It means our economy is very, very strong. Uh, and it also, unfortunately, means that we're, if anything, facing a workforce shortage. Traditionally, um, you had to prove that you were searching for gainful employment while collecting unemployment benefits. Uh, last year, we waived that need to look for work while on unemployment. We wanted to make sure that individuals uh, could be, remain safe in their home to slow the spread of COVID if, if they so chose. Um, and we also knew that uh, given the uh, very uncertain economic uh, crisis that was working hand in hand with the COVID crisis, there just weren't nearly as many jobs available, of course. Uh, but our economy has come absolutely roaring back. Uh, and today there are, as was mentioned, thousands of job shortages. So in response, uh, we're announcing that over the next month, we will be reintroducing our work search requirement at New Hampshire Employment Security. Uh, it does not mean that if you can't find work that you'll lose unemployment, not at all. Uh, all it means is that starting on May 23rd, about a month from now, you'll be required to look for work uh, while on unemployment. It has always been this way before COVID and we're just returning uh, back to our traditional, uh, more normalized system. There are tens of thousands of high paying jobs across the state available today. It's just an awesome opportunity. Uh, since last summer, um, what state has hosted 15 virtual job fairs to help employers find employees to get back to work. Uh, the folks at New Hampshire Employment Security do a great job with these job fairs. They've done some virtually. They're starting to look at doing more of them in person in more of a traditional way. Uh, just last week, we did a virtual job fair. Uh, as a, a bit of an anecdote, we did a partnership over at the Seacoast United Sports Center. We had 100 employers with over 3,000 jobs available as part of that virtual job fair, and we only had about 140 people, uh, actual job seekers, show up. So that's just one anecdote to show the very high demand for workforce right now. We are always helping people get back to work uh, and those unable to return to their old jobs can utilize the state jobs boards, the job fairs to find employment that is right for them. A lot of opportunity out there. And we are announcing this early. Uh, this is announcement kind of a month in advance uh, to give folks time to plan and prepare. This return to the normal process again will be effective on May 23rd. Uh, the date really correlates with our rapid pace of vaccination. Uh, when you look at how fast we're getting the vaccine out, where we'll be with full vaccinations on uh, May 23rd. Um, and uh, that's just, again, just a, a, all a function of the opportunity we're trying to create uh, to get people back to work and, and uh, um, get things more normalized uh, as we come out of the COVID crisis. Uh, so in order to support and facilitate the, the get back to work effort, um, we do want to highlight the um, all New Hampshire Works job centers. So all new, we have New Hampshire Works job centers all across the state, and all of them will be opening up to the public by May 10th. Uh, there are still some that have uh, remained. You can still access them virtually. Uh, they've had limited ability for folks to come in one-on-one uh, -on -one and use some of their resources, their computers, whatever it might be, to look for a job. Uh, some of the one-on-one -on -one work that uh, those amazing staff at, uh, from the state to just to help um, get resumes prepared or, or even uh, prepare folks for job interviews, things of that nature. Um, so those have been limited over the COVID crisis, but as of May 10th, they will all be open. Uh, 
so folks can come in and sit down and, and kind of have a little more of that one-on-one -on -one interaction to help them uh, find the job and uh, that's going to most suit their and their families' needs. And New Hampshire Employment Security will also continue to host job fairs. Uh, there's a few coming up that we are hosting here. You can see on the screen next to me. Um, the state has a virtual event on May 6th focused on helping veterans find employment. Uh, we have two upcoming events on May 11th in partnership with Pinkerton Academy uh, over in Derry. It's focused on students, graduates, and individualized using a lot of the adult education programs. Again, that's on May 11th. We have an event on May 13th focused on construction employment in partnership with the Associated Builders and Contractors of New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, so again, that one's a little more focused in the construction industry, which uh, we think there's going to be an immense amount of opportunity over the next coming uh, next few years as a lot of infrastructure is investment across the country. Uh, and again, that one will be on May 13th. And, and lastly, of course, we'll be scheduling additional events uh, specific to each county throughout May and June. But you can go to unemploymentbenefits.nh.gov. Uh, you can see the website right here. Uh, that's a great place to go just to see where the job fairs are, uh, what areas they may be uh, specializing in. But every one of them has been a huge success for folks walking through the door. So we really encourage folks to take advantage. Um, again, not to you know, be the, the bragging uh, uh, chief executive, but our, our folks at Unemployment Security, or I should say the New Hampshire Department of Employment Security, uh, whether it's dealing with folks on unemployment benefits or providing job op opportunities for individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis, they really do an, an, an outstanding job. Um, so again, that change overall, uh, the change for, the rec uh, for making sure that you are looking for work will start on May 23rd. Uh, and then lastly, uh, really quick, uh, as a lot of folks know, a few days ago we opened vaccine appointments to anyone, regardless of, of where uh, you lived, what your residency was. Um, some worried about a rush on the system, but again, Vinny did a great job, pulled through. Um, we've heard a few anecdotal cases of folks signing on to Vinny uh, weeks ago to find an appointment in May. Um, we want to remind folks that they can constantly check in and move their appointments up. There are appointments today in the state of New Hampshire going unfilled. So um, sometimes it might be an extra five or 10 miles or a different location than what you're used to, but um, there are a lot of appointments available still uh, throughout our system. Thousands, frankly, over the over the next week or so, uh, and over 50,000 appointments available still in May. So lots of ability for folks to move up and, and get their vaccine a little sooner than originally anticipated. Um, and again, uh, just vaccines.nh.gov. That one's next to me too. Yeah, book now, there you go. Vaccines.nh.gov, uh, just for folks to register in the system or just go into the system and see kind of where you are and see if there's a, another opportunity opening up. Uh, we obviously, we want everyone to get vaccinated. It really is a tremendous opportunity to get back to normalcy, get, get out of the COVID uh, crisis. Um, and we've really come out of the crisis, if you will. We're more in kind of that emergency man and management phase. And I think that folks in the state are just doing a, a, a tremendous job of making sure that we can provide that pr protective bubble, if you will, that shield around the most vulnerable population and anybody uh, who wants to get vaccinated. Um, with that, we can open up for questions. What's the latest on the Johnson & Johnson uh, pause? Have you heard anything from the federal level in terms of when that might be reversed? Um, I think everyone is hopeful that it could come in a matter of days. Uh, we had a, a call with the White House earlier this week. Um, they were working diligently. They were trying to get a, a final the final checkoffs, if you will, from both the FDA and the CDC to um, re-release that Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, which is such a powerful tool. Uh, they're looking, on, looking at, I think, everything from additional wording and warnings and things like that that might come with the labels of it. But, um, but we're all very, very hopeful in the next few days it will be released and we'll kind of get, again, back to normal in terms of providing that opportunity. It's, a, it's an awesome tool. And even if they lift that, do we know in terms of shipments when those might start to step back up again? Unfortunately, it doesn't look like those shipments are going to step back up anytime soon. That question was asked very directly of the White House, and frankly, there was not a very good answer uh, in terms of if they had continued producing uh, the vaccine over these past few weeks. There was no, in, they, they didn't give any clarity that that had actually happened, which was quite surprising, I think, to all the governors. So they were clear that over the next few weeks, we should not anticipate a large influx of Johnson & Johnson into the state, even after it has been reapproved. So that's a bit unfortunate, but hopefully over time, they can still meet their commitments and, and provide it, uh, you know, by the, either the end of May, or the, you know, end of, probably not the end of April, but hopefully at least meet some of their commitments through the month of May. Can we ask a question of Dr. Chan? Sure. This might be a little bit of review, but you weren't here last week, so we wanted to get your perspective 
um, on the uh, rescinding of the mask mandate. Can you share, take with us, uh, take us through how you advised the governor on making this decision and, and whether or not you were in favor of it? Yeah, so a uh, question about the mask mandate. And, and first off, uh, apologies, I, w I wasn't here last week. I was um, gone with my family on vacation. And um, so that, that was uh, not meant to be reflective. At, my absence was not meant to be reflective at all of uh, that, that announcement last week. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but look, I, I think that um, myself, the governor, public health in general, are all in agreement with the importance of mask use um, continuing as um, a layer of protection. Um, we have evidence, more and more evidence, that masks are effective at preventing and, and controlling spread of COVID-19. Uh, and so regardless of whether there's a mask mandate or not, um, we, public health and the state, will continue to recommend uh, that masks be used whenever people are outside of their homes in public locations, uh, especially in indoor locations where people may be coming into close contact with one another. Um, one of the challenges uh, during this pandemic is how to um, get people to, to change their behaviors, right? A, a lot of the community mitigation measures, the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have been recommending ultimately come down to behavior change. Um, and that's, that's the great challenge here. Uh, a mask mandate is one way, uh, I think, to get people to change their behaviors by requiring people to wear masks. But we know that even with mask mandates, people choose not to wear masks. Um, and so public health tends to operate, and, and I think we're most successful when we operate um, in, from a standpoint of looking at how we can um, engage communities, collaborate with individuals and businesses, uh, and get people to understand uh, that we're still in the midst of the pandemic. Um, masks continue to be important as a control measure, uh, and that regardless of whether there's a mandate or a requirement for people to wear masks, uh, that we you know, continue to recommend uh, that people wear masks. And even as we're ramping up vaccination, uh, strongly encourage people to do so. Um, so, you know, I think the, the mandate is, has gone away, has expired, uh, but the recommendation for people to wear masks uh, remains. Um, the contagiousness of these variants is pretty high, and that's we're seeing more and more of the variants as the percentage of the whole. Um, do you expect the variants to skip the track at all in terms of the seasonality of coronaviruses, uh, or, or will we start to see a seasonal decline along with our vaccination? Yeah, so, so interesting question about what the trajectory of the pandemic might be, especially with emergence of, of the variants. Um, the, the seasonality of uh, the, the novel coronavirus, I think, still remains a little bit unclear. We've seen multiple peaks and multi multiple spikes and surges th uh, over the last you know, 13, 14 months. Um, what I will say is that there is actually data um, that has uh, suggested um, this second sort of peak that we're in uh, right now. We're actually, you know, second, third peak um, that we believe likely is, is um, at least contributed to by the emergence of the variants. Right? I'm thinking back to some, some modeling that the CDC did um, early in January, looking at the emergence of the B117 variant, that's the UK source variant, which has now become the predominant um, variant or strain of the virus across the United States. And because these variants are more infectious, because they're more easily spread person to person, um, they're going to be more difficult to control. And so I, I think that the, some of the modeling studies have shown that there's a, a, another smaller peak expected, but that with continued high level vaccination with continued attention and adherence to social distancing and face mask use and avoiding crowds, uh, that we can bring these numbers back down. And hopefully the, the trend that we've been seeing in the last week in terms of the declining incidence of COVID-19, the uh, declining test positivity, that the beginning um, of the hospitalizations may be starting to go down, that, um, that we, we can continue to drive those numbers down further, uh, drive community spread down further with um, increasing vaccination and continued, continued attention to you know, social distancing and face masks, et cetera. Thanks. Uh, Governor, as far as vaccine hesitancy is concerned, where's New Hampshire at with that? Where's the uptake of the vaccine and the acceptance level of the vaccine in the state of New Hampshire? Well, I think it's very good, uh, yeah, especially when you compare us to where we are with other states. Um, and, and I base that on first where we see our uptake within long-term care. 
where we've seen the uptake in our healthcare workforce, which is very important to instill confidence in our communities, and the uptake that we've seen in the various uh, the bands of the 50 and up, 40 and up, 30 and up, 16 and up, uh, is all about where we expected it to see, uh, to be. And I think it, it'll keep increasing. My, my, I think our general sense is that even though everyone's had weeks now to be able to get into our system and get a vaccine, there's still some folks that might wait till the summer, some folks that might wait till it's more convenient, uh, some folks that just might wait till till they feel more comfortable or maybe have, uh, maybe some folks want to don't want to get it or do want to get it through their uh, direct uh, doctor. Right, and we're going to be transitioning more over the next month or so, so that your your primary care physician or, or the hospital associations they have much more control in, in the distribution of this as as they should. They're they're our healthcare providers, and they do a great job of that. Pharmacies as well. So uh, we think that over time it'll it, it's not going to end. Even though everyone's had, even though you know our our system may go more to a healthcare system, I think folks are going to keep trickling in and getting the vaccine for the first time all through the summer potentially. But obviously not at the high rate we're seeing right now, which is, allows us to make that transition. Do we have a number as far as who's eligible to get the vaccine that's actually gotten the vaccine? Yeah, D Dr. Daly? Do you? It's 56 percent. 56 percent. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Of people who, have, who are eligible have gotten the vaccine. Correct. Want yes. The vaccine. Okay. They've actually had a needle in the arm, so okay. to say. Gotcha. Correct. Um, yeah. so the CDC put out a map of talking about estimated vaccine hesitancy, and in New Hampshire, Coas, Grafton, Sullivan, and Cheshire counties were the highest expect estimated hesitancy rate in New England. What can be done about that, if, if anything? Um, well, I, th there's a couple different potentially a couple different reasons for that. Those tend to be more of our, more of our rural communities, uh, of course. Um, it's not about access. We want to provide as much access as we possibly can, and I think the state has done a very good job of that, given that we have such a high rate of vaccine uptake. We have one of the highest rates of, um, of distribution of the vaccine in, in the country, frankly. So I think overall we've done a, a very, very good job of that. Um, I don't want to say that this county is better than that county and this county is doing a good job. That's, that's not fair to that county. It's not really county per specific per se. Um, it's just about getting the, the messaging out as strong as we can. Uh, and I think, you know, with the new PSAs that we're doing, whether it's the billboards, the digital ads, all, all of that, talking about the, the safety of it, the efficacy of it. Um, in those counties, they just haven't experienced as high level of COVID uh, as, as other areas, which might be a contributing factor for why some folks are a little more hesitant to get it. They don't see the immediacy of it, which, of course, it, it, it is an immediate need. Everyone really has to uh, be a part of that community solution. But it isn't a, I just, I wouldn't separate it county by county. At the state level, when we do, we, su we supply PPE, we supply testing, we supply vaccine. We don't look at it at a county by county level. Uh, we just get it out as fast as we can, wherever we can. And I think the state's done a, done a very good job of that. I know with the prison outbreak, that's a federal prison. But is there concern given the surrounding area that, you know, there's members of the community going in and out of that facility? Obviously? Well, the, I guess the only, you know, the federal prison situation is very frustrating because it's kind of an island unto itself. We we don't have any real interaction with that facility. We don't provide the vaccines. We don't provide the testing. The federal government was supposed to take care of all of that. And frankly, they, they didn't do nearly as good of a job as the rest of the state. The only silver lining of that is I believe the number of actual staff that has been infected as opposed to inmates is four. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very low number. So that would be your gateway to community transmission or, or, or interaction. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of um, uh, residents of the of the federal prison that um, were either not fully vaccinated or or not offered the vaccine whatever whatever those reasons might be we really can't answer to that because that's it's not our system it's the federal bureau of prisons that handles that they do things very differently in the federal bureau of prisons than the new hampshire prison system um, i think the new hampshire correctional system does a very good job when it comes to vaccines interaction with public health federal bureau of prisons is, is very different from that governor you can have uh, is there going to be a new universal best practices document that's going to be in play after May 7th, and if so, what How's work going on? Yeah, so that's a great question. The reopen, uh, the reopen committee that has looked at all of the uh, uh, documents that kind of have provided the guidance and, and the regulations around the emergency uh, is looking at taking a lot of those and putting them into a single universal best practices. Um, it's very similar to the universal guidance we, we already have now. Uh, and I know Dr. Chan and Public Health have kind of had their input on it. Our office has, has it, had their input on it. And I believe some, if not this week, then uh, maybe tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow they're going to be talk, taking that up uh, at their meeting. And then they'll kind of send to us some of their recommendations and we'll put the final touches on it and hopefully get it 
it out next week if, if it's ready for prime time. But um, that group does a, a terrific job at looking at all the details and talking to the specific industries. Um, we want to make it more as universal as we can um, because we, it's not going to exist for one month or, or three months. It might exist forever. Right? So we want to make it as broad and universal as we can, um, try to get away from the 42 different specific industry guidance documents that we currently have, um, because uh, you never know what could change down the road for a specific industry. You never know what new industries could come up. We just want to make it as encompassing and as easy to manage as possible for whatever the business situation would, would arise. Let's allow a business industry association to decide on its own. We want to go beyond that document. And you talk with these industry folks all the time. Do you get any sense any industries are looking to go beyond what you're probably going to recommend? I, I don't think so. And by, on, by beyond, I just want to be clear, more like more restri restrictive? More restrictions, less capacity than you yeah. say is okay to have? Or An industry could always do that if they chose to do that. Uh, an individual business, though, can always has the, yeah. the flexibility. So it's not going to, we're simply saying, again, it's just not state-mandated rules that, at, you know, the end-all, be-all, absolute, and must. Uh, it's a little bit... Uh, uh, I think it's a very similar situation as we did with schools. Yeah. Early on with schools, we provided uh, a kind of a universal guidelines for schools. It wasn't fixed mandates on any of the stipulations, but schools did a phenomenal job managing kind of themselves, understanding where they could and couldn't necessarily meet certain stipulations. They still provided a lot of flexibility uh, to be successful for those kids, and, and, and by and large, I think they were, given that we didn't have any major outbreaks in our school system over the course of the year. So. Um, uh, so overall, you know, there's, I think we all have a lot of faith that uh, this is definitely the right step. We do everything stepwise. We do everything data-driven. Um, I, I, you know, when we make the decision on removing the mask order or, or uh, pulling back on some of on, on the business restrictions on May 7th, it's all data-driven. And frankly, you know, when we're telling that story, that's a very important part of it. That fatality rate down 95 percent, that's a huge part of the story that has to be told. The fact that vaccines are going up so rapidly, a huge part of the story. So folks know that, that we're not just doing this on, on a whim or, you know, putting our finger up into the wind and hoping for the best. We're really looking at all of these trends and those data markers as they come together. Is it concerning to you at all, Governor, that the, the super site had to be scaled back to one day? I mean, is that indicative of a starting to plateau from this sort of rocket takeoff on the vaccine? Oh, no, no. The super site being scaled back to one day is more of a function of people interacting with Vinny and moving themselves up to get their, their second shot. I believe that's, that's safe to say. And so people took the opportunity to move themselves up instead of waiting four weeks, three weeks. Uh, they were able to do it. So I think it's an awesome sign that people are kind of taking – um, you know, their vaccination in their own hands, so to say, and we can just be a lot more efficient with it. So, no, it's, it's actually a really great thing that we could, we could cut it down to one day. As we start to eventually see that trajectory right. flatten out a little bit, will there be greater intervention at all in terms of PSAs or trying to really drive the message to get that last I don't know, tranche, if you want to call it, of people who might be able to be willing to get vaccinated? Yeah, I mean, I think it'll be a consistent message, if anything. Um, I don't know, you know, we'll, we're pushing as hard as we possibly can at, at this point. That's all really people talk about right now is, is vaccines. So, um, I mean, the word is out for sure. I really do believe that as we transition into the, um, the healthcare system as a whole, taking over the responsibility of distributing vaccines and working one-on-one -on -one with their patients and patients being able to, individuals being able to work one-on-one -on -one with their providers, you may see a, a higher increase in uptick in it because you get to talk about the pros and cons, the side effects of each of those uh, vaccines and the potential. And we'll have more options in terms of, um, you know, when we have, when vaccine outpaces demand, we'll ha I think we'll just see more options of I want that vaccine, I want this vaccine, I want it at this time, I want it at that time. And that kind of flexibility hopefully will provide more opportunity for people to, to get it and more comfort in, in their willingness to get it. Will the fixed sites come back if we need uh, a booster in the fall? We're not planning on that. I think what the, the hope is we've talked to the hospital association and the hope is that the hospital association will be able to take up the need if a booster were required. Right now there's no uh, indicator that, that a booster is required. We're, Remember, folks were getting their va initial vaccines in December. So if there were a six-month requirement, per se, as was uh, initially discussed, I think we'd know about it by now because that would be coming up in May and June. So um, I think the hope is that if that were to happen, it would be in the fall or next year, uh, or it would just be uh, to a 
part of the most vulnerable population, maybe the elderly or something like that. So again, I think all within the, the management uh, scope of the existing healthcare system, as opposed to everybody, you know, ask, asking everybody to rush into the system at once when there was a limited amount of vaccine. We'll also just have so much more of it, right? It won't uh, be the state kind of controlling the, or I should say the federal government controlling the distribution and the state getting it out won't be as much of a, of a priority because the health healthcare system, uh, the hospitals themselves, the pharmacies themselves will have hopefully plenty of it and folks can make their appointment and come in it as they like. What's your reaction to us all learning about these breakthrough cases where people who are fully vaccinated get COVID-19? Uh, Sullivan County Nursing Home announced that they had a resident vaccinated come down with COVID-19. Just your reaction to bring this Well, it's, it's, it's expected. Uh, we know there's going to be breakthrough. These the vaccines were never 100% uh, against getting any symptoms or, or catching COVID. Right? They were, I think, 94, 95%. So you know, one out of 20 people that have been vaccinated are still susceptible to, to getting COVID or even being symptomatic to COVID. Um, I think with the Johnson and Johnson, it's even slightly a little bit higher. Uh, the key for for me, and I think for a lot of folks, is um, it's very strong efficacy, the 97, 98, 99 plus percent in terms of not, uh, protecting against fatality and, and the most severe symptoms of hospitalization. So folks getting COVID, even though they're fully vaccinated, isn't a shock. That was always uh, kind of built into the numbers and the expectation. Un unfortunately, we knew that that could happen. Just like folks might get a flu shot, but still, still get the flu. We, we heard st a lot of stories like that. This is even more viable than that, which is the good news. But folks getting COVID is, isn't a, an absolute shock. The good news is, is that for the vast, vast, vast majority of folks who have been uh, vaccinated um, uh, around the country, there's very, very little, I think far less than 1% in terms of a, a fatality rate or severe hospitalization rate, which is exactly the numbers as, as they were predicted. So that's all good news. In regards to employment, is there a particular, I saw the construction um, job fair, is there a particular industry in New Hampshire that you're concerned about being underemployed at all? All of them. I don't know anyone who isn't looking for workers right now. I've heard from all the industry, especially tourism industry right now is a big one as folks try to get at least that seasonal uh, worker. Um, a lot of folks are having some, some luck getting the seasonal workers in. Some of them come from out of country, which is a great opportunity. But I'm um, just getting other folks uh, into those, uh, you know, tour travel and tourism is a big deal for us. And all those businesses, restaurants right now especially, are gearing up hotels. Um, that may, might have been closed longer than normal are all gearing up. I don't know anyone who isn't who isn't looking for work. And then you add on top of that all these new tech companies and these new manufacturers that have moved in here over the past year. Um, you know, we reconfirmed. I went back to if you remember, there was a stat that we gave out about uh, towards the end of last year, and I went back to the Department of Revenue Administration and I confirmed less businesses closed in New Hampshire in 2020 than they did in 2019. Think about that for a second through all the economic tribulation and hardship and unknown, because what we did with the CARES Act, because we put so much money back into the economy, because we, I think, maintained a lot of, um, you know, we put a lot of restrictions in in terms of business, but we also were able to keep those businesses open and, and flexible enough to, to be successful where they could be, uh, or as successful as they could be in such trying times. The fact that less businesses closed in 2020 to 2019 is nothing short of a miracle and an amazing testament to the team and finding that balance. We have one of the lowest fatality rates in the country. You know, Massachusetts, New York have one of the highest, but we were able to maintain one of the lowest, even though we're effectively their suburbs, um, and, and still have far and away the strongest economy in the Northeast and uh, and provide a lot of opportunity. So we didn't have those unfortunate business closures. Some some did close, of course, and. You know, there, there are stories out there, and they were, they were tough stories to hear, of course. But overall, uh, economically, we're, we're, we're really booming here, and that's, um, that's, that's great news for the future. Do you have concerns with school vacation week and people traveling? Yeah, I mean, I think any time we see a holiday, right, we, we get a little bit concerned. We, we, Dr. Chen and I were talking about whether it was Thanksgiving or Christmas or even, uh, even the 4th of July. Even our numbers were so low over the last 4th of July and Labor Day, if I remember. Numbers were very low, but you saw a little bump there. Um, there's always a bump when folks travel uh, as they come and go, um, and they're just more social when they travel. It's not just the act of traveling. I think airlines have done a very good job of, you know, I think they all require masks. I think that's a, a national standard right now, um, and they, I think they've done a good job managing the crowds and keeping people socially distanced in an airport for the most part. Uh, but when you when you vacation, you're just more social. You're hanging out with your family or friends or whatever it is. You're visiting folks, and so obviously there's that tendency to, to see a natural bump uh, post-holiday, and I imagine we're I, I suspect we'll see that as well. Um, but again, 
if that bump, as we have over the past few weeks, uh, exists in a younger population, a population that is uh, more, um, has a bit more strength to manage the, the symptoms that can come with that, um, that's exactly why our fatality rate is just so low uh, right now. And, and so if we have to get a bump, um, hopefully it's in, it's in that, that population. If they haven't chose to vaccinate themselves by now, um, you know, it's, it's with the population that's either making that choice or can withstand the symptoms a little better. Do we have some on the phone? Uh, yes, Governor, you do have a handful on the phone. All right. And the first question comes from Kathy McCormick with the Associated Press. Kathy, please go ahead with your question. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is a question for Commissioner Chimenez. Uh Can you give us an estimate on the percentage of residents and staff at long-term care facilities who are vaccinated now? And what efforts are being made to ensure that new incoming residents and staff get vaccinated? Are pharmacy partners still involved in getting the vaccine to those groups? Great. I'm going to have Dr. Daly take that. Um. <clears throat> Great, thank you for the question about the vaccine uptake in our long-term care facilities. So as you know, the, the Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program vaccinated the majority of our long-term care facilities um, in a big push over the, at the beginning of the year. And so the data that came out of that program showed that 85% of our residents in those institutions and 75% of staff chose to be vaccinated. So those are really great vaccination rates and I believe are among the highest in the country. Going forward, we absolutely want those residents and staff to be able to access vaccine. The way that they can access that vaccine is through our state programs and our partnerships with um, the pharmacies that serve long-term care facilities in our state. So we're not using that federal long-term care pharmacy partnership program anymore, that has ended. And instead the, the institutions, the facilities can access the vaccine through other pharmacies that they normally access medications through. Great. And your next question comes from Paula Tracy with In-Depth New Hampshire. Paula, please go ahead with your question. Yes, good afternoon, Governor. Hello. Um, I have two questions today. Um, one is, um, <coughs> if we know how many out-of-state residents have signed up to get the vaccine in New Hampshire, and whether um, that supply may be limited um, for residents because of that, um, and the second question is the vice president is coming to the state tomorrow. Are you planning to greet her and do you have a message or a request for her? Sure. Uh, so uh, right now about 10 to 12,000 uh, out-of-staters have signed up into our system uh, to receive a vaccine in New Hampshire. So it was far less than we anticipated. I thought it could be upwards of 50,000 or more. Uh, we have plenty of vaccine to, to handle that. Um, th those could be out-of-state uh, residents that don't live here. They could be folks with second homes, um, out-of-state uh, um, students, whatever it might be, for any reason. So, no, there wasn't. There actually wasn't that high of a demand there. So, therefore, it really doesn't won't affect our overall uh, vaccine distribution. We still have a lot of vaccine available, and we encourage everyone to, resident or not, to sign into the system and, and take advantage of it. Uh, the vice president will be. Um, we have the honor of, of uh, greeting the vice president and, and hosting the vice president tomorrow. It's always an honor when the president or the vice president uh, chooses to visit the state of New Hampshire. And yes, I'll absolutely be be greeting her there. I, as, as far as a message, I, I haven't really thought of it much other than the most important message, which is welcome to New Hampshire. And the next question comes from Anne Marie Timmons with the New Hampshire Bulletin. Anne Marie, please go ahead with your question. Thank you for taking my question. I have two questions. Um, the first is, and Dr. Daly maybe addressed this, there's a discrepancy on the CDC site um, between how many vaccines we've been given, how many we've um, given to um, folks, and there's more given than we've gotten, but I'm, I'm thinking we might be counting them differently. Um, so if Dr. Daly could address that. Second question for the governor, um, is regarding the workforce shortage, the student uh, loan or payment program has about $5 million in it that could lapse at the end of the year. Um, mental health centers, especially say they really need that money. Do you support letting that remain in the hands of the program or do you think it should lapse back into the general fund? Sure. So um, let me deal with two very separate questions. Let's talk about the, the numbers. First, I, 
I think I speak for everyone. The CDC, I, I don't, we don't know exactly how the CDC gets their final numbers. Um, there are other federal programs that the, that the government contracts with directly. Um, maybe it's through the VA, uh, the program to distribute vaccine through the prisons. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. The um, FQHC program they have, their direct pharmacy pro program. So they've, the, the new administration has done a lot more with direct federal programs that the state has no uh, real contact with. So I don't think it's, I'm not sure exactly where the CDC gets all their data. I can tell you in terms of getting the, the vaccines out, um, you know, we keep track of our data, our numbers that come in. I think they're very accurate and, and the, the folks have done a great job and New Hampshire keeps crushing it. So unfortunately, there's just a lot of other federal programs there that the CDC tracks directly through the federal government that we just, uh, we don't have our, that it doesn't really come through the state. As for, the, as for the student loan repayment program, absolutely. I love the student loan repayment program, and I hope that, the, the, that the, our recommendations as part of the budget, which would put another $10 million in student loan repayment, doesn't cost taxpayers a dollar, by the way. Uh, it's a great idea and a great opportunity to expand student loan repayment to all aspects of our economy, all different types of, um, of workforce opportunities, whether they be in community-based mental health, whether they be nurses, whether they be doctors, whether they be in biotech, uh, manufacturing. Uh, for me, I think there's just a lot of money, a lot of opportunity out there. There's a lot of innovative ways to do it that doesn't put a financial burden on our, on our system, but incentivizes students to stay and work in New Hampshire while paying down their student debt, which we know can be you know, much, much higher than normal uh, if you come out of either the community college or, or the university system here. Another reason why I want to join those two systems together and, and find a lot of synergy, I think that programs like that can be that much more effective uh, when doing that. So anything to broaden in, in that program, it's something I've been advocating for uh, for three years now. The Democrats took it out of my budget last time. I'm going to work with the Republicans majority to try to get that reinstated this time. And Governor, your next question comes from Michael Graham with the New Hampshire Journal. Michael, please go, please go ahead with your question. Governor, thank you. Uh, you've spoken at these uh, COVID presses quite frequently about uh, uh, social justice issues, the uh, George Floyd case back about a year ago this summer, you stood here and uh, encouraged people to participate in Black Lives Matter marches, even though they were in violation of the lockdown order. You declared Derek Chauvin a murderer a year before the trial, and you put a Black Lives Matter activist on your LEAC committee. Uh, this week, the New Hampshire Black Lives Matter chapter has declared, along with the New Hampshire ACLU, that police reform is no longer a realistic goal. Quote, the system can't be reformed. We're not asking for reform. We are asking for abolition. Given the calls for abolition of police and the treatment of the police officer who saved a woman uh, two days ago in, in uh, Ohio by shooting the person trying to stab her, do you think the push for reform has gone too far, has the pendulum swung too far, and do you think you play a role? Uh, I, and do, I missed the last half of the question there, Michael. Do I think the pendulum swung too far and... Did you play a role in it? Do, did I play a role in it? Yeah. Oh, dear Lord. Um, look, <laughs> let me be very clear. I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for positive uh, reform, not just in law enforcement, but in all aspects of our community. And I've always said, you know, we don't have systematic racism throughout uh, New Hampshire, but we have elements of implicit bias and, and racism in all parts of our, our, our communities. And it's something that I think we have to be very constructive about. Um, the LEAC Commission came up with 40, 50 different recommend, recommendations um, and unanimously, and I, we took them all up. Some we did with executive action, some we did uh, have to be done through a legislative process, uh, and a lot of those will get completed through a legislative process, and I think it's just the beginning of a, of a, a very good opportunity for the state of New Hampshire, uh, not in a combative way, but hopefully in a constructive way, working with law enforcement, community um, uh, leadership, uh, folks in, on all kind of all aspects of this issue uh, to enhance our community policing, enhance the training opportunities at police standards and training, enhance what happens um, with every with all aspects, whether it's in our our, our schools, our libraries, uh, our, our police force, local police, state police, whatever it might be. There's always an opportunity uh, to to do better, and and I think you know while we didn't see some of the. The, the violence you saw in other parts of the country, um, I think it, for all of us across America, it was a, a moment to, to take a pause and say, okay, we can talk about do, doing better or we can actually do it. We can actually kind of, you know, put, put pen to paper, you know, whether it's on a policy change, uh, find a funding opportunity. I just think there's an immense opportunity. And, and again, we're, we're going to do it, uh, regardless of what, 
any individual might say at, on, on any given point at any given time. We are, this state is moving forward, I think, in a very progressive uh, and constructive way. And by constructive, I mean all hands on deck. Does it mean we're going to get everything done that I think we, we can get done on day one? No, probably not. But that's, that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Sometimes you got to go back to the drawing board, get everybody together. Some things are easier. There's always some low-hanging fruit out there. And some things are just more challenging to find out what the, you know, um, maybe unintended consequences of a certain action might be, making sure you hear all sides of the issue. And they just take longer to get done. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, working a little harder and taking a little longer on a few of the tougher issues to get it right is more important than rushing it just to say you got something done in the first place. I don't know how, I, if anything, I think we've, I think I've, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I think as a team uh, in New Hampshire, right, from the, the Civil Rights Bureau that we set up over at the Attorney General's office um, to the uh, Commission on Diversity and Inclusion that we set up a few years ago uh, to really talk about these issues on a community uh, spread. We all are kind of, while we don't agree maybe on every last point and dotting every I and dotting every T, I think as a whole we've done a great job uh, promoting these things, talking about these things, and going about it in the right way. And Governor, your next question comes from Ali Pham with New Hampshire Public Radio. Ali, please go ahead with your question. The AB to today. Um, so, first one is um, according to the data provided by DHHS, a little under 22,000 doses were allocated to the vaccine equity program as of last week. And that would appear to be below the state's goal of using 10% of its available vaccine supply for vulnerable populations. Can you tell us um, what share of the state's vaccine supply has gone to equity clinic clinics? And is the state adjusting its strategy or directing regional public health networks to change their strategy to make fuller use of the equity allocation? And then my um, second question is, um, it touched on this a little bit, but with those breakthrough cases, which I know are to be expected, but I did want to hear a little bit more about how the state is tracking them and if we know that if any have been uh, variants and if any fully vaccinated individual has died of COVID-19 here in New Hampshire. Okay, Dr. Daly, I think um, I'll let her, I'll let Dr. Daly, I think she's got most of these answers for you, but again, what, what she can't fill in, the governor will I'm, I'm, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Great. So the first question was around our equity allocation, which you'll recall we have committed to ensure the equitable distribution of vaccine in our state, and we have set aside 10% of the vaccine that comes in each week for our regional public health networks to work with the communities and identify great opportunities to reach very vulnerable populations, uh, people who have barriers to accessing vaccine, either low income, transportation barriers, uh, people who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, either due to age or race and ethnicity. And so we've been working with them for many months to set up these clinic opportunities to get vaccinated. And so far, they have coordinated 280 clinics and have plans to vaccinate 26,000 people through those clinics. Yes, this is less than the 10% that we um, have set aside and have wanted them to, to vaccinate. However, we've always understood that these populations are going to be harder to reach. We might be doing uh, clinic events in partnership with a soup kitchen or a, a homeless shelter or, and might be doing fewer people than our mass vaccination clinics, of course, right? So it's harder to reach population, harder clinics to set up and, and get established. They've done a really great job doing it. That's almost 300 clinics and thousands of people vaccinated through the program. So it doesn't really uh, require any type of change of strategy. We've realized this is going to be our hardest populations to meet, which is why we've dedicated um, this, you know, dedicated resources to this work. And we want them to keep setting these clinics up and I expect that they'll continue to do this even as we move forward um, with our vaccination efforts. And we don't want vaccine to go unused. So when they aren't using the va full vaccine each week, we'll go ahead and make sure that vaccine gets used in other settings, but we'll still make that vaccine available to them in future weeks. If, for example, they did have a big opportunity to, to do, for example, a low income housing unit or something really large. So I think that answers the first question. And then regarding the second question, vaccine breakthrough, we are monitoring the vaccination status of the COVID-19 cases that get reported to us. Uh, we ask for this information to be reported when 
providers report a case to us and we also collect this information when we conduct case investigations. And so we verify any vaccination information that's provided to us. So if someone says they've been vaccinated, we do verify that information to make sure that all the dates line up and that they would meet our definition of vaccine breakthrough. And that means that the person tested positive more than 14 days after they have completed the vaccination series, whether that's a two-dose series or a one-dose J&J vaccine. Um, so we're tracking that information. Uh, we are, these are coming in as reports to us on a regular basis and we have many under investigation, but so far to date we have confirmed 24. So 24 breakthrough infections. We are aware that two individuals did die. These both were associated with long-term care facilities. Um, and unfortunately, again, as, as the governor said, these are not unexpected. Uh, however, they've also prevented many, many infections as we've seen the case counts and deaths come down in our long-term care facilities and even statewide. Thank you. As usual, she nailed it 100%. All set on the, phone All set on the phones, okay. Uh, one quick one about high school sports. Guilford High has 100 people in quarantine, and the superintendent says it's largely connected to spring sports. Should you, they, schools consider taking a pause with spring sports? No, or? no. Look, I think schools have done a great job through the fall, through the winter, and I think they have the right uh, kind of program in the spring. Um, it was unfortunate that they, uh, there was kind of this uh, outbreak, if you will, through, spring, through this one spring sport event. It happened a few weeks ago. Um, uh, but I think schools overall have done a great job throughout the state, you know, managing it. You know, kids, whether sometimes it means kids might have to practice with masks or all, you know, that sort of thing. But no, we, we wouldn't tell the, everyone across the state that you got to start stopping spring sports, especially when the vaccine is available, especially when the symptoms are so low. Um, and, uh, and so again, it's, it's one unfortunate event, but it doesn't define uh, the state. I think overall the state has done a phenomenal job with, uh, with sports and we want kids to get out, right? We want them to play sports and get out in Little League and soccer however they can in safe ways because you know across the state when you talk to maybe some of the youth rec recreation leagues in towns or the schools themselves um, they're taking a lot of precautions they really are doing a great job but still providing that opportunity for kids which is so important and then with April vacation I know you said you know there's a maybe possibly a bump to come with that so and I know the vaccination rate is going well but do you want people to stay home and not travel or what would your advice be for April um, my advice to folks would be to be, be smart about it, right? You know in your family, for example, um, who's vaccinated, who's not, who's vulner more, more vulnerable, who's not. Um, and we're, we're really at that point where because vaccine is so readily available, uh, because we've been able to protect the most vulnerable part of our population, it's really up to individuals to make that choice for themselves. And, you know, there's nowhere, for example, if you're going to travel on a plane, you're going to be wearing a mask. You know, there's a lot of stipulations in place. You're going to be doing those things. It's hard to, to not at least be doing those things. And as Dr. Chan talked about, you know, that kind of, you know, getting folks to understand the importance of behavior, the importance of, um, of their habits, of, of good habits, whether it's wearing masks, social distancing, good hygiene, they're all still so, so important. And I think a lot of folks, either they're going to do it or they're not, right? So uh, we just want folks to be safe and be smart. And I think by and large, people do a very good job with that. Hence the, our incredible data that we have here that allows us to make more decisions on flexibility. Given the real small numbers here, you think for you and Dr. Dale, if she had any thoughts on this, are we ever going to be able to conclude um, there's a type of person who's more likely to be breakthrough than other types of people? Obviously, with two passing away in long term care settings, are people with co occurring serious medical conditions more likely than the average person? perhaps get a case of COVID mm -hmm. despite being fully vaccinated. Yeah, I, I would turn to Dr. Daly. It's a very Dr. Daly question. So the question is, are some people more likely to have vaccine breakthrough infection? And I think the answer is that we're actually still just learning about this. They're still aggregating the data at the national level. There have been about 6,000, just under 6,000 reports of vaccine breakthrough reported nationally, and CDC is reporting this on their website if you're interested in that. And about half of them have been in older persons, people I think 65 and older or so. So I think we're learning about it as they collect this data. Okay. Governor, how would you gauge public reaction to the lifting of the mask mandate? I know you recommend that people continue to wear masks. Sure. Seems like a pretty good number of people took it as kind of a checkered flag. A checkered flag as, as in, in to I mean, say we're done? Oh, I, I would disagree completely. People just not wearing masks. 
Uh, I would disagree with that. I, I, I think very little has changed. I think when I go into Walmart, I'm still wearing my mask. When I go into a Dunkin' Donuts, we're still wearing our mask. When I walk into the State House or we do our business in, in meetings and groups, by and large, most people are still wearing their masks. When you look at the poll, I think UNH or somebody did a poll, um, I think overall people understand it. They understand that what we do here, I'm not speaking for the rest of the country and other states, but here we look at data, we look at trends, we look at science, um, and that's exactly why we've made the decisions we've made, and we, we showed the charts right here, right? We're very transparent about the hows and whys of what we do, and I th think folks understand that, and I think folks have done a very good job of understanding the importance of their, I'll go back to that term, behavior and habits uh, of protecting themselves and the most vulnerable. Um, but no, I, I walked down the street to Concord the other day, everyone's still wearing a mask. A lot of cities are still have their mask mandates in place, so I, fundamentally, I don't think a whole lot changes other than the state having a you, the thou shalt must. I think our habits are, are pretty good, and I think people understand the importance. And I think there's a lot of respect for understanding that, well, maybe someone I'm, I'm nearby didn't get vaccinated. Uh, but as more and more vaccine comes out, um, it's just going to be, and as we get to better weather, folks are just more out and about. I think overall, yeah, people will find a little more flexibility in their own lives to, to have that. But I think in the last week, not, not a whole lot has changed. And I don't really look at polling. I think the poll said, yes, you know, people understand the hows and whys of what we're doing. It's not like some of the other states that you saw where there was massive reactions, you know, one way or the other, the politics of it and all that. We don't, we don't do any of that here. So I think folks, we've had a year to really make sure that folks, when we say that we're, they're with us, they're with us because um, they can see the data, they can make good decisions for themselves and, and they understand the hows and whys of what we do, the importance of public health, having those strong messages around uh, the, that responsibility uh, for yourself and others. Okay, great. Well, thank you guys very much. We will be next, back next week. It, news just keeps getting better and better, but we still, we're not at the finish line yet. We want folks to, as was discussed, be responsible, be smart, um, be safe if you're taking vacations or long weekends. Um, hopefully the weather will warm up a little bit from the snow we saw today, and we will be back next Thursday. Thank you, guys.